your Bible. We're going to open up to Acts chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 22, and we're going to read this scripture that I just uh, I find very interesting. And while you guys are turning there, I'm going to read you the definition of what a servant is. What is a servant? Does anybody know the definition? Uh, you cannot use the word in the definition. I'll just tell you what my teacher told me. Um, a servant is a person who performs duties for others. A person who performs duties for others. By definition, if you are doing something for somebody else, you are a servant. The question is, is whose servant are you? And um, are you performing duties to serve yourself, right? For my own self, uh, for me to feel good. That's why, you know, oftentimes on earth we have philanthropists and they're non-Christian and uh, we can perform duties for others out of selfish ambition. Like, hey, when I give, it feels good. It's a biblical principle. So when you give, the Bible says it shall be given unto you, pressed down together, pressed down together, shaken over, or pressed down, shaken over, run it. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Uh, but I had to look at my wife and get some clarity here. But, uh, and so we see these bi biblical principles at work, and the Bible says that it's better to give than to receive. And, and there's that kind of a servant where, where people will do things for others, but it's out of a self-seeking reward. And the Bible says, we talked about this last time, is that you've already received your reward here on this earth, and there is no reward left for you in heaven because you've already received uh, what you were looking for. You've already kind of gotten that, your, your feel-good moment. Now, there's another kind of servant, and there's people that do things for other people, and it's not out of obligation, but it's, but it's out of a desire to serve Jesus. So we can do things for others, and we'll be blessed here on this earth, and also we store up a reward in heaven. Servant, a person who performs duties for others. You're welcome. I hope you found the scripture that you were looking for. Acts chapter 17, verse 22. It says like this. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So what's going on is Paul is walking around this uh, Acropolis or um, it's basically a temple. And in this temple, you can imagine uh, Leanne and I, when we went to Italy, we saw these temples and they would, um, they would basically be like little windowsills or whatever. And in every windowsill, they would, you know, they would have different gods and they would have different idols. And, they, and you know, this one would be to the cow god and there'd be people worshiping there. And, and this one's to uh, the shoe god and there's people worshiping Nikes there. And, there. and then there's this one and there's this one and there's this one. And, and they had all the, they had the god of sex, for real. They had the god of the moon. They had the god of the sun. They had the god of fertility. They had the god of war. And then Paul's going around and he's saying, man, I've seen all your gods. And quite frankly, you're all very religious in the sense of you're worshiping something. It's an idol, but that's your religion. So you're worshiping these things. And, and he says, but I came to this one spot. He, these people had so many gods that when they couldn't think of another one, they, they literally left, they had this, place of worship like a little uh what do you call those Saint, uh, shrine like a little shrine and there was nothing in the shrine and it said to the unknown god to the unknown god and paul says pa pa paul's walking around and and today we're going to talk about when when do you serve when and paul sees this and he thinks to himself i'm going to take advantage of this opportunity because what they're looking for is what i got it's the God, the unknown God. They, they don't even know who he is. In other words, in other words, for you and I, for us, what we need to understand is that everybody is looking for Jesus. They just don't know that it's Jesus that they're looking for. Make sense? 
Everybody's looking for Jesus. They just know, don't know that it's Jesus that they're looking for. People are looking for happiness. People are looking for joy. People are looking for satisfaction. And they'll try to find that in people. They'll try to find that in sex. They'll try to find that in drugs. They'll try to find that in money. They'll try to find it in possessions. But what happens is, is once they've worshipped at the altar of all these gods, they realize that they're unfulfilled. And what your job and my job is to tell them, is to tell them about the one God that they haven't tried. And that's this unknown God. They didn't even know, they didn't even know that they were talking about the God, right? Because these were pagan worshipers. These were idolaters. That's what we all were, right? Until we were saved. And so Paul says, look, I've been walking around and, and just to give you a little bit of the backstory, Paul was brought to this place, and we, you can actually read it a few verses up. Uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and it says in verse 16, it says, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, uh, somebody was supposed to come meet him. I believe it was Timothy. It says, While Paul was waiting for them was at, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jew and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. So the reason that Paul was even in this pantheon, or not, not pantheon, but in, in this Acropolis or in this place of worship was, was because Paul was looking for a reason to tell somebody about Jesus. Paul wasn't waiting around. It says that he was waiting for somebody to come with him so that they could minister together. But it says he, he was so distressed. He was so distressed that seeing people that were, that were so deceived by sin, he's, that, that basically he couldn't help himself. That he started walking around and looking and talking to anybody that would listen to him. It didn't matter. Oh, you don't want to hear me? Cool, keep it pushing. You don't care? I'm going to tell you. It, that was his attitude. When do we serve Jesus? At every opportunity we can. As Christians, we, we serve Jesus by making the most of every opportunity. Servanthood. Servanthood is this place in our life where we start doing things for other people, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of them, for the salvation of their souls, out of our love for Jesus Christ. Let me read you guys another scripture. The wandering Paul. I love this guy. The more I read the Bible, it's weird. I've read this place so many times, but I see it different today. Colossians 4 and verse 5, it says, Likewise, no, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everybody. Let me read that again. Live, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Another translation says, let your conversation be gracious and full of salt. Gracious and full of salt. And what that means is that let it be, let it be purposeful or let it be useful. Let it be, let it be pleasing. When you're talking with a non-Christian or when you're talking with a Christian, don't be full of, don't be full of emptiness and just empty chatter. Whenever somebody talks to you, they're like, man, I don't want to talk to him. He's a fool. She's a fool. I don't, I don't want to talk to them. They're just silly. But let your conversation have some kind of purpose to it. Let your conversation be full of love. Let your conversation be full of grace so that at the end of it all, we can lead people to Jesus. This, this grace, I think, is, um, is something profound and it's something that we need to work on as Christians. When we're, when we're talking with people, we shouldn't be so quick to judge them. When we're talking with people, when we're, 
looking to share the love of Jesus Christ, we shouldn't be so quick to, to discount them and throw them out. Because Jesus does not love you more than he loves the, non, the, the non-Christian. The sinner and the non-sinner, the sinner and the Christian have an equal place in God's heart. God desires, the Bible says, for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth, which is in Christ Jesus. So look, I'll tell you a little story. Yesterday, um, it's funny. Yesterday, I invited my father-in-law over so he could help me tear out my kitchen. And uh, I've never torn out a kitchen before. And when you haven't done something before, I mean, do you know how to tear out a kitchen? Have you done it? Pull it out? That's not how it works. But it was close. Without breaking it. So my wife sold it. First of all, my wife is the best salesman I know. She sold everything we have. Like, she sold her couches, anything. She sold everything that we needed to sell. And then she sold this old kitchen from 1999 for like a thousand bucks. For real. Um, It's pretty crazy. It's like really old. And I'm like, man, I don't know how you're going to sell it. But she sold this kitchen for a thousand bucks. Anyway, and they were like super happy. Like they were so grateful and like gave us money. They didn't even take it. They gave us the money. They're like, how much, how much should we give you? I'm like, dude, give us however much you want. And they're, and they're like, oh, okay, can we give you a thousand? I'm like, sure, that's great. That was the point. But anyway, so this really old kitchen and I'm trying to remove it because my wife sold it. And I'm trying to remove it in a way where I'm not gonna break it, where I, you know, I can't use a sledgehammer. I would have loved to. I've never taken a kitchen apart, and I thought, well, my father-in-law, he's not only built a house, he's built multiple houses. I'll invite him over, and he'll help me do it. And so my father-in-law got off of work in Everett, like, at 4 o'clock. He was supposed to be there at 5 or 5.30 or something like that. And so I I was home at 3, and I'm sitting there, and and literally, I'm sitting there probably on the ground because we don't have any couches. But I was sitting there, and I was looking at the kitchen, and I'm like, I got to wait here for two hours. And then I thought, I, I cannot be that dumb. Like, I can't, there has to be something I can do. And so, you know, my father-in-law, he gave me uh, a bunch of tools and drills and all kinds of stuff. And so I'm like, this stuff looks fun. So I take some of my powers. And anyway, so, so I thought, well, the least I could do is I could unscrew the cabinets. Like, I know how to use the drill. I know how to use the screwdriver, whatever. So I start, uh, I start unscrewing everything. I take out all the, I take out all the screws and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, I can probably do some more. And to make a long story short, by the time my father-in-law had got there, I'd taken everything off. <laughs> the work was done. The work was done and, and I'd removed all the cabinets and nothing was broken. And I took off all the granite and nothing was broken. And, and I was so proud of myself. I sent pictures to my wife. I was like, look at y'all, man. Girl, you didn't marry just no preacher. I get my hands dirty. I got super glue on my fingers. You married a man. I'm so proud of you. I'm like, yeah. I took it all. Man, I even, I even moved the granite. Like, I, I, I was hulking on this thing. I don't even know how to remove cabinets yet. The point that I'm trying to make is that sometimes... We don't know. We don't know what to do and and we're waiting and we're sitting around the church and we're waiting for some leader to come and tell us, well, hey, you know, at first you should probably start unscrewing unscrewing the the screws from the wall and then you should probably start lifting them off and then you should figure out how to pull off the granite and cut it and there's a certain way to do things. And so oftentimes what we do is we sit around the church doing nothing for years, waiting for some leader to come. The leader might be years away from approaching you, years. My father-in-law was hours away from telling me how to do something. Maybe maybe the leader that wants to recognize you is years away from even approaching you because they're so busy. I don't know. But the worst thing you could do, the worst thing you could do is sit around doing nothing. You know, I... I started simply by unscrewing some stuff. By the end of it, I I guarantee I could come to anybody's house and take down their kitchen. I know how it's put up. I've taken it apart. I've gone the long route. I have. I made some mistakes. It's true. But it's all intact. It's in good shape. I could come to your house and I could help you. Who, Who needs to take their kitchen down? You don't have a house. Understood. Christian, 
I'll come to your house. Want me to take your kitchen down? All right, because you're going to have to pay me if I do that. <laughs> Can you not pay me? The point is that start doing what you can, even if it's something simple. Well, I don't know how to do anything in the church. I can't preach a 30-minute sermon. Who asked you to preach a 30-minute sermon? If you want to preach, come see me. Preach a three-minute sermon. Nobody needs to preach a 30-minute sermon. I preached three-minute sermons for the first year. Nobody taught me how to preach. I remember I'd get up there. We'd have one verse, me and Vasily Matsuk, and we'd rotate every week. It was rough. There wasn't very many of us, and there was a reason. We get up. I still have some of my first ones. They're half of, they're, they're one verse, and I, and I would write the verse out because I had nothing else to put on the page. I didn't know what to write. I didn't know how to preach, but I, I wasn't going to sit around and wait for something to happen. You start serving when you have a desire. You start, you start serving when you fall in love with Jesus. God bless you. It doesn't matter if you start small. The Bible says very clearly, do not despise small beginnings. Do not despise small beginnings. Because by the time you're done with your little stint and you're going to be so busy serving that, that when a leader approaches you, you'll, you'll not only know how to do what you're supposed to do, you'll know, what, you'll know how to do their job. And not because you're boastful or proud, but because you've been quietly serving Jesus wholeheartedly. Not looking for recognition, not looking for somebody to call you a leader. But because, you're, but because you have a desire to do good for other people. And so God himself will call you good and faithful servant. It's a title that isn't given because, oh, well, you're a servant. No, no. A servant is somebody who does the work. And the definition of somebody who's doing work for other people is a servant. It's the definition of your life. It's not, it's not a title that's given. It's a definition of your life. And when we stand before God, the Bible will say, enter into my rest, good and, faith for, good and faithful servant. Or he'll say, away from me, I never knew you. One of two things. One of two things. And I'm going to get to my last point. Man, this time. I'm telling you, Andre was right. You cannot. You can't get the time back, man. Time is fast. I'm going to give you guys one more point because I, I am going to try to end early. Look at this. Oh, I got two more points. I, I've given you two points and I haven't even told you what they are. I'll tell you real quick. Point number one is that you serve uh, when there's an opportunity. Point number two is that you serve when you're asked. Point number three is that ultimately you will start serving or you'll start doing things for other people when you fall in love with Jesus Christ. Look at this story from the Bible. It's, a, it's in John 21 and it says it like this in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? In other words, he's calling him out. He's like, Victor, do you love me more than everybody in here? More than everybody. And Simon, he was a bold man. He goes, yes, Lord. You love me more than Marta. You love me more than, than Sophia. You love me more than that. You love me the most out of everybody in here, right, Simon? And he's like, yep, that's me. I love you more than everybody, Jesus. And then, and then Jesus says to him, Jesus said, feed my lambs. In other words, feed the sheep. Feed, feed the people of Israel. Jesus said, to, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Third time he said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. 
say, do not want to go. Yes. That's for everybody who says, I don't want to do that and do not want to go. This is a good thing to remember. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Feeding, being a shepherd was no easy task in those days. It was like, if anybody has a father who's a truck driver, it was like that. They were gone for like weeks at a time. Unless, you know, your dad has the short shift and whatever, he's back at night. But it's like a long haul trucker or even worse, uh, the, the, the airplane pilot. I think those guys have one of the worst jobs in the world. It's like a trucker, except that they don't get paid until the door shuts on the plane. Um, it's one of the hardest jobs anyway, because they're gone for so long. So there was the same thing with the shepherd. It, it was a job where you would have to leave for weeks at a time and, and you'd have to take these sheep around and, and you'd have to direct them, protect them from wolves, sleep outside. It, it was an extremely hard job. And that's what Jesus was asking of Peter. He says, if you love me, will you do this hard work? And he compared it to shepherding because it's not easy to serve people who are ungrateful. Very often, very often, the people that you serve will not be the most grateful for the things that you do. But you're not doing it in order to please people. You're doing it in order to bless people and please Jesus. As a Christian... You either have this and you are a Christian or you don't have this and you're not really a Christian. If you have no desire to do good for somebody else for their sake, the Bible says that the love of the Father is not in you yet. And I don't say this to like condemn or hurt somebody's feelings. I say it as a good, it's a good check for our own life. It's a good check for my life. When I'm, when I'm serving, does it, become, does it become a burden to me? Or is it my opportunity? How do you look at servanthood? How do you look at the things that you do in the church? Well, I have to do this because they, they want me to. They. Or <laughs> I get to do this because they asked me to, and I get to serve Jesus in this way. I'll tell you what. The person who wants to do it, it's obvious. Their work is incredible. They want to do it. They get it done in a timely manner. It's, it's something beautiful. It's something presentable. And it's presented to a holy God. Do not, you know, I, there's a scripture and, and it talks about uh, uh, David was going to make a sacrifice. And he, and this is when he was a king and he comes to this and he comes to this man and he says, hey, I want your ground and I want to build it build an altar here and I want to make a sacrifice to God so sell me the goats sell me this piece of land and let me make a sacrifice and the guy's like no 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 listen look you can have all my real estate you can have all my cattle take whatever you need King David and 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 you can sacrifice to God all you want and if it was like a lot of us in this room would be like heck yeah we just that was a blessing from God we just inherited real estate you know but that's not what David did you know what David says? He, he says this profound thing. And, and I remember when I was younger and I just started tithing and giving in the church and started giving of my finances, David said this thing that was so profound and it just stuck with me. He says, I will not give to God something that didn't cost me. Or in other words, I will not give to God something that is not precious to me, something that cost me nothing. He, and, and what he tells the guys is, I want to buy your cattle, I want to buy your land, and I want to pay fair market value, and I want to do everything right because I'm given to a holy God. In other words, like Andre was saying, I'm going to sacrifice the time. I'm going to give my effort. I'm going to give of myself. I'm going to give of my finances. And this isn't to bring glory to me on this earth because I want recognition, but this is to bring glory to my Father in heaven. And because I love Jesus, now the love of the Father is in me, And now I love people. It's impossible to serve that way unless you're in love with Jesus. You can't. People will not give of themselves sacrificially unless they're in love with Jesus. 
You, you can't. We'll do it out of selfishness. We will. And, and I'm not saying, like, like I said, I'm not, I'm not saying this to like condemn anybody or hurt you. What, what I'm saying is check yourself. Check your life. Why are you doing things? Why aren't you doing things? Sometimes you ask people to do something and it's like, I shouldn't have asked. Like, well, I broke my leg and my mom there. I'm like, dude, your leg is fine. You're talking to me. You're standing on your leg. I saw you running. Well, it hurts now. Okay, we don't want your help. Go find the next guy. It's easy to do the things that I want to do. But when Jesus was talking to Peter, he says, you're, the time is coming where, where you're going to be dressed and you're going to be led to where you don't want to go. And you're going to go because you love me. Sometimes we do things that we don't want to do. These aren't bad things. These are, these are things that bring glory to God. These aren't, these aren't, it's just hard work. Ministry is hard work. Servanthood is hard work. Giving sacrificially is hard work. But anybody who serves in the church, I, I guarantee they'll all tell you the same thing is that it's the greatest time of my life. It's the best thing I've ever done. And, and they will remember it forever. Some people nodding at me. Because it's true. When you serve God wholeheartedly, there's nothing like it on earth. Because you're fulfilling the purpose, you know, there's this old school song, some of you probably never even heard it, but there's, it's like there's a God-shaped hole in all of us. You know, it's like we need God. It's this, it's this, it's the, it's the worship of the unknown God. And, 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 and when God comes and fills that spot, it's we're fulfilled. And that's what happens when we become true servants of Jesus Christ. Love to the Lord is to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome is what the Bible says. Love to the Lord is to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. Let's go ahead and stand. If I get somebody on the keys, I'm gonna finish early today. We serve when there's an opportunity. We served when we're asked to serve. And ultimately we will only do those things wholeheartedly when we're in love with Jesus. Servanthood is, is optional, but we take that option as an opportunity when we're saved. We want to serve, we want to give, and not just give what we can, but we want to give more than we, we want to give sacrificially. I don't want to just give something to God that I have extra. I don't want to just give him my extra time. I don't just want to give him my extra finances. I, I want to give him something that costs me. Is that a true statement for you? Do, you? do you truly want to give God something that costs you? Your time, your energy, your finances? Where you have to cut certain things out of your life because here I'm serving God. But we were gonna go do this and we were gonna go do that. And, but what about all this other stuff? Well, no, 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 this time is set aside for God. That's a different way of living. That's a life of servanthood. That's a life of a servant of Jesus Christ.